Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are talking to Frederick Voss, who is the Vice President of Blockchain Innovation at NASDAQ. Now, we'll talk about how NASDAQ is approaching the blockchain space, what Frederick in particular thinks about the applicability of blockchain technology to capital markets, and other topics. Frederick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we begin, tell us about your background and how you got to be interested in this technology. Yeah, so uh, I actually joined the capital market space uh, in 1995. And most of that time, I've been working in commodity derivatives uh, involved in the business management and operations of commodity derivatives exchanges and uh, clearing houses for commodity uh, derivatives. I did that up until about two years ago when I got a question from NASDAQ if I wanted to be part of our blockchain innovation initiative, which is at that point in time was two years old, uh, but it was more a pure engineering initiative then, and we expanded it out to involve also more business people, and that's how I got uh, sort of involved with this uh, space. And so how does a company like NASDAQ go from uh, looking at this as uh, sort of a, um, uh, an engineering uh, space, right, where mostly engineers are involved in it, to deciding that uh, they should hire a VP of blockchain? I, I think the way to answer that question is to put it into a wider uh, context uh, in terms of how this fits into NASDAQ overall. I mean, most people, in at least in North America, would associate NASDAQ with being the stock exchange for uh, publicly listed companies. Uh, but we think of ourselves as a engineering company in capital uh, markets and actually beyond in some cases. And uh, one of our big business lines is actually to provide software solutions to other exchanges, clearing houses, CSDs, uh, brokers, banks, market surveillance organizations around the world. So I think overall, something like 100 exchanges around the world run on NASDAQ software and technology. So any new technology or pre-existing technology that people believe can play a role in capital markets get sort of the same treatment within NASDAQ. We investigate the technology, we analyze it from an engineering perspective, but also from a business perspective to see if it can uh, sort of enhance the way capital markets are working. Can it bring increased efficiencies, increased productivity? Can it enable new market structures, uh, new kinds of business uh, models? So we uh, have uh, about a dozen similar uh, work tracks, so innovation tracks going on in addition to the blockchain programs. So we work with machine intelligence, capital markets leveraging cloud technology, internet of things, uh, mobile, uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that, that's how it sort of fits into the greater picture for us. NASDAQ is exploring like all of these different technologies and their applicability to capital markets. And like in your answer, you mentioned that you sort of judge these new technologies on, on whether they can bring increased efficiency, increased productivity or sort of new business models. Right? So t tell us what are the measures of efficiency and productivity that that you think can be enhanced in the capital markets today? Where could the big gains come from? Yeah, so uh, th I think that also depends upon where you are in the, in the sort of transaction chain. I mean, we have seen over the last 20 years, we have seen an incredible innovation and evolution of the price discovery part of capital markets. So the exchange part, the trading of securities. I mean, we've gone from floors where took minutes to, uh, to execute a uh, transaction to actually uh, chasing nanoseconds now and co-locating uh, algorithmic and high-frequency trading application with the actual central exchange matching algorithm. So, uh, and we have mobile access for, for retail clients in a way we didn't have before, of course. So there's been a huge innovation over the last 20 years in the price discovery part. Where we have seen less innovation has been in the uh, sort of post-trade plumbing. Once a trade is done, the actual settlement of that transaction 
uh, and the payment for the shares and the delivery of the shares, to just take that as an example, has not seen the same kind of uh, innovation. I think that is where this technology potentially fits in. It sort of brings a promise that we can create faster, cheaper processing, less need for reconciliation, less need for capital to cover uh, extended periods of time between the execution of a transaction and the settlement of the uh, transaction, but also uh, brings a promise of perhaps providing greater transparency for regulators and society as a whole into what is going on in capital markets. I mean, this of course remains to be proven on a large scale, but uh, those are the promises of the technology, and we see that the use cases that it's used for in capital markets aims to address at least some of those uh, points. But it'll be some time until we know for sure if that actually is the case. But it looks pretty promising, we think. Now, regarding this this idea that uh, you know, sort of back office uh, systems has, have not evolved, uh, you know, this is something that we that we see across capital markets, whether it be the financial sector, insurance. Um, but there has been a lot of innovation on on sort of the front end, whether it be um, sort of front office systems for uh, within you know banking organizations or capital markets organizations, and also in terms of innovation towards clients and user experience and new services and things like that. Why do you think there have hasn't been as much innovation on the back end? Why do you think that those systems have stagnated so much? Well, first of all, you have to admit that they actually work pretty well. I mean, we are these systems and processes and procedures actually function well. You have a you know very small amount of erroneous trades and uh, uh, and the sort of fails in that process it handles you know a fantastic uh, uh, amounts of value in those systems so they work pretty well but actually it is also because that there hasn't really been you haven't really had access to new technologies that could potentially have had sort of enabled that uh, innovation. So on the front end, we've had you know increasing processing capacity. We have co-location. We have mobile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here we've sort of been sort of leveraging the same technology that's been around for the last twenty years. So the technology itself hasn't perhaps sort of enabled the same kind of uh, structural innovation that we've seen being able in in the front end side of things. And uh, and as a, a VP of blockchain, uh, tell us what what is your what does your normal day look like? Like, well, what are your roles and responsibilities in NASA? Yeah, so I mean, uh, it is a lot about still doing uh, things like this, uh, you know, media panels, uh, evangelizing to some extent, both both uh, externally but also internally within the uh, within the uh, company. I of course contribute to our decisions in terms of what should be the objectives of this initiative at any point in time. That evolves quite quickly. Also proposing strategies for how to achieve those objectives. Uh, because of my background in the capital markets, I do get involved in the identification and selection of use cases, POCs, products, pilots, uh, etc. Uh, Nasdaq has a, a investment fund for that we do innovation investments, and where there are sort of blockchain opportunities in that space, we I get involved in that as well. And also helps to coordinate resources across the organization. I mean, Nasdaq is not phenomenally large, but it is 5,000 people dispersed across the globe. And many of our initiatives are sort of decentralized. And we have many groups in the company in various parts of the world that are working on blockchain related initiatives. And we try to, I try to sort of help coordinate to make sure we don't do the same thing twice or that we pick up uh, loose balls and get someone to run with them. So uh, I think that is. That is the, uh, the sort of the uh, typical day for me. Okay, so let, let's uh, let's then you know, perhaps talk about Nasdaq. So, I think most of our listeners will have uh, heard about Nasdaq. Uh, it, it is not only a sort of an, em, an emblematic part of uh, of New York's um, uh, skyline, I guess, or you know, the, uh, um, you know, being there in Times Square, and and also um, is the second largest. Uh, stock exchange in the world. But uh, you mentioned earlier that NASDAQ was an engineering company uh, that builds software in the financial markets uh, and financial uh, services space. Um, you know, Maybe expand on that and, and, and tell us things that perhaps people don't know about NASDAQ or don't realize uh, about NASDAQ. 
Yeah, so uh, as I said, a very significant part of our business is actually providing technology to uh, to uh, capital market infrastructure uh, service providers around the world, exchanges, CCPs, uh, CSDs, uh, etc. Uh, we also do provide uh, services to uh, uh, corporate investor relations solutions, corporate governance solutions, uh, etc., etc. And we've sort of done this for more than ten for more than 10 uh, years. We, of course, we you can say that we use what we sell and we sell what we use because we are also a user of this technology. Uh, in NASDAQ in its own name, uh, operate a quite large number of exchanges, for example, in North America, where we of course known as the NASDAQ exchange on Times Square. But actually, uh, almost all of the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries are exchanges and clearing operations that are actually uh, run by NASDAQ with a NASDAQ uh, brand. And this gives us, of course, a unique position in, in creating valuable technology in that we, we use the technology ourselves. So all the knowledge that we acquire from that operation, we can uh, incorporate in our solutions. But we also get a great feedback and great collaboration with our clients around the, the world. So uh, we think that is a sort of pretty fruitful uh, integration between those two business uh, lines, if you want to call them that. So, so NASDAQ both builds like the technology for exchanges and clearing and also operates one of the like the larger exchanges in the US and the Nordic nations. Correct. Uh, so in North America, I think we run more than 10 exchanges. So we have stock exchanges in the US and in Canada. We have a commodities exchange. We run fixed income markets. Uh, we have a large, uh, actually several derivatives markets that we run over here, and the same thing in uh, same thing in uh, Europe, where we run the exchanges in Stockholm, Helsinki, Copenhagen, Reykjavik, and the Baltic uh, countries. We run some of the central depository uh, uh, companies there, and we also have a pretty big derivatives clearing house in the in the Nordics. Uh, that's correct. So, in terms of like blockchain technology, what what parts of this technology do you think are the most interesting for NASDAQ? Like what capabilities from this technology could be the most impactful for your business? So, I mean, so currently you can say that most of the, the initiatives that we're working on or, or pilots or MVPs or, or, or projects, they, 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 they are in one of three buckets. And some of these projects actually touch more than one of those buckets. So first of all, we are interested in how can this technology play a role in uh, sort of the, the the plumbing of the post trade plumbing, as we talked about a couple of minutes ago. So that's one area of great interest to us. The other area is, uh, you know, how can this technology help society actually, and you know, society typically delegate this task to regulators to get greater insight into what is actually going on in capital markets? Can we create greater transparency for regulators to see where systemic risks are forming, where concentration risks are forming? So that's the second area. The, uh, the third area is, can this technology somehow enhance the relationship between the issuer of an asset, uh, you know, a company, for example, and the investor? in that uh, uh, asset. For example, in the US today, in the public market, it's a quite long distance between the company, the issuing company, and the investor in the company. If that communication has many intermediaries, could this technology allow, where you have all the parties on a network, can this technology allow for a closer collaboration between uh, uh, companies and, the, and its investors? So, Typically, most of the invest in sort of the initiatives that we do now is in one of those three buckets. It doesn't mean that things beyond that is not of interest, but you know we have to start somewhere, and and those are the ones that have been uh, sort of closest to uh, closest to us to start with. One thing that strikes me is that uh, a, a lot of the use cases that we see in blockchain, and we see them sort of applied uh, in public blockchain, so for instance, like ICOs and trading assets and transfer of tokens uh, representing value, um, you know, these things can be, could potentially be quite disruptive to NASDAQ's business. How does NASDAQ look at this technology uh, from that point of view where it can be at the same time quite disruptive and quite disruptive to your core business, but at, and, and meanwhile, uh, also 
uh, allow for you know, your back office to uh, be uh, up, upgraded from its current uh, state to something that's perhaps a bit more modern, uh, where information flows uh, much more fluidly, where the regulator has uh, a lot more insight into what's happening? I, I think there are two ways I'd like to answer that uh, question. The first one is like, you know, you, you innovate or you die. I mean, if a new technology comes along, it has application to a market where you're involved in, you have to embrace it. Uh, otherwise, someone else will embrace it. And, and, and then, you, then you may be in, in trouble. When it comes to disruption of businesses, I think one has to be a little bit more nuanced than the, than the discussion typically is. And that is that there are so many components, there are so many parts of a capital market transaction chain. For example, the price discovery, the management of buy and sell orders and the actual matching of these orders where we now see millions of, of those order transactions per second uh, in today's uh, listed markets. It is difficult for us to see that this technology is so incredibly disruptive for that part. Where it is disruptive is, of course, or potentially disrupted is, of course, where where the core strengths of the new technology lies. And that is, of course, keeping track of possession of the digitized asset in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So yes, if your business model is to, to do that particular job, if, you, if, you, if you're the trusted third party that does that job, of course, this technology asks some questions about that. Or if you can speed up things with this technology and your current business model is dependent upon there being an extended period of time between the transaction and the settlement of the transaction, then of course this technology potentially asks questions of that model as well. So yes, uh, in, 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 for example, if you're a, 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 a securities depository, uh, you know, there are, there are certain parts of your activities that could be potentially challenged by this uh, technology, but it's not like all capital markets or participants or all capital market intermediaries or all capital market activities are in the uh, sort of hair cross of this, uh, of this technology. So one has to be a bit nuanced when we talk about disruption in capital markets. Where is it really applicable and where is it not? Uh, and of course, that piece about, I mean, if something new comes along, either you innovate uh, leveraging that uh, new innovation or, um, uh, you know, you risk that someone else does it for you. So like in terms of like uh, your interests uh, in the intersection of blockchains and capital markets, you mentioned three of them, which is one is on the on the post trade process side. So um, after a trade is done, the settlement and the in the tracking of uh, of the various assets. The second is uh, tech blockchain technology is some way enabling greater transparency to regulators on what is going on in the market. And then the third is blockchain technology might help in improving the relationship between issuers and investors in like the communication between uh, issuer and investor in some way. So let us walk through all of these three and uh, dig, dig a little deeper into what all of it means. Right? So in terms of post trade process, could you give us an overview of how the post trade process works today? And at what points it might be well, it might, uh, blockchains might prove an advantage in, in that process. Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, how they actually work depends from market to market and asset to asset. But you can say for listed asset, uh, uh, generically, you have a, a, a trusted third party in the middle. And that is the party that keeps track of, uh, of uh, who is doing what. Uh, every single transaction that is done is copied a gazillion number of times. All the parties in the ecosystem have their own copy of, uh, you know, have their own version of the truth. And there's a lot of resources spent on reconciliation of those, uh, of that status at, at the end of the day. Now, if we could now have a, an agreed um, uh, view of the, uh, of the status of, of, of the ecosystem, of course, there are a lot of those activities that would, you know, be cheaper or not would, would, would not have to be done in the same way as today. And, you know, an ex example to prove that point was a pilot that we run in the private company share space in the U.S. And of course, that what the, the project that we call the Link project 
where we made an application that leveraged uh, leveraging sort of the chain blockchain technology that allowed a, uh, for example, a, uh, you know, when the board in a private company makes a decision to issue shares, the CFO can get out to his or her office and actually print those shares uh, in, 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 in sort of blockchain transaction, issue those shares to its investors immediately. And when there were secondary market trades in those uh, uh, shares, investors could transfer those cha shares between each other independently of a, of a third party. Now, of course, ultimately what that is, that is an alternative market structure that is enabled by the technology. Uh, so that is an example of what we mean by that. And of course, the relevance of this depends, is dependent upon which market you're in, the current structure of that market, uh, uh, and, and, and the needs and desires of the participants in, 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 in each particular market. So that, I think that is the short way to describe it, in our opinion. So are there, are there any markets in, in, in particular where you foresee that this application of blockchain technology will flourish first and then it will go on to the other markets? So are, are, there, are there like some like signals or are there some characteristics of particular markets which uh, make it easier for this technology to penetrate that space and not other kinds of markets? Well, as I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, most of these sort of the post post trade infrastructure, though all actually works relatively well uh, today. It is not like we have masses of complaints on it. So. Uh, but this, of course, this technology potentially enables alternative structures to that. We don't necessarily think that that is where it's going to start. Actually, change a market structure from a trusted third party to a peer-to-peer -peer is a very significant undertaking. And the bigger the price is, the more significant it is in terms of number of participants, in terms of complexity of technical uh, existing technical ecosystem, in terms of the number of decision makers involved to, to get a change to happen. So we think that the initial commercial applications of this technology in the post-trade plumbing piece will actually be to lift markets that currently operate on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, structure, uh, uh, but maybe using not the most efficient technologies around and actually apply this technology onto an already existing structure, but you do a technology enhancement. So uh, the link pilot was an example of that. We're working uh, actually with a client of us uh, here in New York called NIAX, which is the New York International Advertising Exchange. They have bought a solution from us that leverage uh, this kind of technology for, for this kind of market structures in, a, in the advertising space. So I think that's where it's going to start. Now, if these early adoption uh, cases proves that there is great value in this, then I think the uh, traditional markets will be uh, more inclined to invest in in uh, transitions to 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 a new structure enabled by a new technology. But they want to see some evidence of the benefits before taking that leap. In our opinion. So another area of application that you mentioned is greater transparency to regulators, and this is obviously something that speaks uh, that speaks to me is uh, because you know, Stratum is, is building uh, blockchain networks that allows for you know, inter-enterprise processes to be more transparent, um, and where integrity is guaranteed, authenticity of data is guaranteed, and uh, and of course the regulator is part of this, uh, where uh, the regulator can have sort of. And to quote you in, in your uh, great Forbes article, a special set of goggles to uh, peer into a, a, a process. Can you give us your point of view on this and how uh, blockchain technologies can be beneficial to uh, an organization like NASDAQ from this point of view? Yeah, and again, it goes back to this, this fact that this technology could potentially enable a, a, an alternative way of doing things that traditional technology could not. So it goes back to that uh, relationship between the technology and the chosen market structure. And it, it sort of this, this starts with the market structure, really, and the technology is just an enabling technology in a, in a way. But today, in many markets, the structure is, of course, built on sort of before you get to the ultimate beneficiary or the ultimate owner of an asset, you have a 
great number of intermediaries in between uh, that and the marketplace. You have brokers, you have transfer agents, you have registries, you have depositories. So actually to find out who is holding a position is quite hard and it requires a hell of a lot of reporting of of who holds this position. Yeah, but that position was held on behalf of someone else who was holding it on behalf of someone else and down the chain goes. And actually trying to reassemble who are the beneficiaries or who holds the position is quite hard. Now, if you actually had these participants on a network with sort of addresses attached to them, you could of course potentially, you could imagine at least that that the, the sort of the accumulation of the identification of what does the market actually look like, who is long, who is short, which participants, they not, may not necessarily be named, but where in the ecosystem do we have these potential concentrations? That could be simplified by a, 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 a network-based technology like this, rather than these sort of fragmented silos that we have in many markets uh, uh, today. But not all markets are the same. There are actually markets where you have uh, greater insight into the who is owning what, for example, and m a lot of that is actually not technology uh, related. That is because those are the rules uh, in a particular uh, market. So it's a combination of what the technology can enable and the particular rules and structures of a particular market. You mentioned ecosystems. This, this is, I think, something that uh, maybe we should spend a bit of time on because I was just at an event today and talking to to insurers, and I think that one of the things that uh, corporates uh, in the capital market space really need to uh, wrap their head around is this this idea of ecosystems, and that the future is one of network economies, is one of ecosystems where we break down these silos, where we sort of work very differently from how we did in the past, right? Where organizations are independent and they have a, their own siloed data. Um, can you talk about ecosystems from the point of view of NASDAQ and you know, what those ecosystems could look like um, you know, if we were to apply them to you know, the, your business lines? Uh, that is a pretty uh, long and difficult question to answer, but when, if we take, a, take again, we go sort of go back to uh, exchanges and clearing houses. These are already uh, you know, ecosystems today. You have, you have, for example, the exchange. The exchange has members. The members trade on behalf of clients. You have transfer agents. You have registries uh, involved in keeping track of who is owning what and so on. And that this sort of infrastructure is today a mishmash of uh, of uh, technology from from various sources that are that sort of integrates with various APIs and and so on. And it may not be the most efficient way of organizing uh, things or setting things up, but they are ecosystems where the, 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 the sort of the, the benefit of one party in this ecosystem depends upon another party doing uh, its job properly. Now, the question is, uh, can, you, can you sort of leverage new technology to enhance the working of those uh, eco, uh, ecosystems can, does that mean that certain roles and activities that some parties do in this ecosystem change? Yeah, maybe, but, uh, I think, you know, it's a difficult question to, 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 to answer. And, and I sort of, it remains to be seen, uh, in a, in a way, of course, in the public, uh, uh, in the, in the public, uh, blockchain space, we, we see that the way sort of you organize, uh, how those are organized and that ecosystem, how those ecosystems w sort of look. And you can say that, of course, they look significantly different from sort of traditional capital market ecosystems and how they look and how they are organized. So, you know, uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that sort of evolves in the future. Now, so uh, w one of the, the major challenges, I think, in, in implementing these technologies, at least uh, in, in the enterprise space um, and coming from the coming from the point of view of a you know a company that's building consortium networks uh, not necessarily deploying on, on public blockchains is uh, is is building these consortiums where they don't exist or uh, where they do exist where there are already ecosystems uh, one of the ch I think the major challenge is figuring out the governance and uh, getting everybody on the same, uh, on the same page to adopt a specific technology or a specific uh, stack uh, to implement uh, in, in a consortium network. Um, 
can can you give maybe your perspective on this and you know how uh, Nasdaq uh, is approaching this uh, this challenge? Yeah, totally. I totally agree with you uh, on that. One of the uh, uh, that's one of the key challenges to adoption of this technology in capital markets. And and while many participants subscribe to the vision of the benefits of the technology to actually be in a position to get anything implemented, you of course have to agree on the on the exact details of the blueprint and how do we want this to uh, actually work. Okay, we can have T plus zero settlement, but maybe that's not the way we want it. Or uh, governance, we need to agree on governance to your point. How do we want the governance to look like uh, uh, for uh, uh, for this particular uh, initiative or this particular market? But I think that is only one of the challenges to, uh, to adoption of the technology on a wide scale in capital markets. You also have the issue around uh, legal and regulatory um, not necessarily compliance, but in order to pave the way for some of these very innovative business models that could be enabled by this technology, you would also have to have some legal and regulatory innovation in parallel with that, because some of these models are so innovative that it's not the problem is not that they are prohibited by existing laws and regulation. The problem is that they are not contemplated. So there is sort of a legal vacuum in which to deploy these models and no one is going to allocate billions worth of assets to a structure where the uh, sort of legal certainty of what does this particular transaction on the blockchain actually mean uh, in, in the eyes of a, of a court, for example. So th that is also an area. And then, of course, we have the usual boring sort of uh, coming out with a new technology. It is not deployed in a, in a completely new world. It is deployed in an existing world. So there also need to be a lot of integration, uh, technical integration and technical transition from old technology to new technology. And of course, that is not a showstopper. That happens all the time, but has an impact on the timeline. And all of these things, together with the sort of the core evolution of blockchain technology, has to happen in uh, in 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 parallel and sort of be agreed by everybody. So it's a pretty chunky uh, initiative to to see those changes uh, being deployed on a large scale. And that is one of the reasons why we think, actually, as I said before, initial commercial opportunities is going to happen in markets uh, where those challenges are uh, a little bit less than in the larger uh, markets, for example, and they get sort of a trial in those in those uh, uh, markets and in those uh, structures. So the way we deal with it is that we work with our clients, we work with our members, we work with our technology partners, we uh, we work with our uh, clients on the technology uh, side, like uh, I've mentioned NIAX, we're also working with the Swiss Exchange. We have a couple of other initiatives that are not yet publicized. And, and that sort of is sort of how we try to not start with a giant consortium, but to start with a core group of dedicated people and sort of expand the, the group of participants from, uh, from, uh, from there. But uh, it is not saying that the alternative approaches can work as well. But this is this is sort of how we have uh, ad addressed the situation, at least now initially. So uh, the another item that you mentioned in sort of use cases is uh, blockchain technology somehow improving the communication and relationship between the issue issuing body and the investors in the asset. Uh, Tell us, tell us why blockchains make a difference difference here. I mean, some of that is also going back to that. Some of this is not about the technology. It's about how market is organized and the structure of the market and the number of intermediaries and so on. But if you today, if you are, if you are a uh, publicly listed company in the U.S. today mm -hmm. and you want to send something to your shareholder or uh, for voting purposes, for example, or you just want to you know, send them a coffee coupon or a coupon for ice cream, whatever, something real simple. There are, it's quite complex to do that. And a lot of intermediaries involved to make sure that the, the uh, uh, intent, or what you want to do is actually carried out in accordance with your intent. 
Now, of course, if you're on a, a network-based technology like a distributed uh, uh, ledger network, that is super easy. You can just send a digitized asset to an address on the network and it's done. So one of the use cases that we, pilots that we ran to try to demonstrate this was uh, a, a remote voting application that we built and uh, we've deployed the pilot in Estonia, in, uh, in, in Europe. And um, the, um, uh, what that showed was that for proxy voting purposes, we could leverage the technology for, to, 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 to get a company to actually digitize the votes, send the votes to its investors. The investors could then do whatever they wanted with those votes. They could vote with them. They could send them to someone else on the network to vote in their behalf. And we could sort of increase the speed and the efficiency and the cost at which that happened compared to sort of uh, how it works today. Uh, so I think that is an example of what we meant by bringing parties closest to, to each other. I'd like to come back to this question of regulatory oversight. And uh, again, I'm uh, this... Uh, I use this all the time. Uh, the the special goggles for the regulator. I just I just love that, and so does Richard. Uh, so uh, um, that, that was a great quote, by the way. And um, so in, in terms of regulatory oversight um, at Stratum, anyway, we 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 sort of see the regulator as a super client. So we obviously work with with corporates, and we work with uh, with, with uh, large companies in, in the insurance and, and financial space and the capital markets, and uh, but. You know, we we kind of see the regulator as the, you know, the super client in terms of uh, oversight and sort of getting industries on board uh, with regards to a certain set of you know, technologies and building consortiums and building ecosystems. What is your opinion on this approach? Uh, and and perhaps give some insights as to how regulators um, are perceived and what role they play in the U.S. market and in the European markets and how that might be different? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on on the various regulatory entities across the uh, uh, world, but I think the role of the regulators changed significantly after the financial crisis of 2008. That is really when they got interested in sort of understanding more in real time, sort of getting clever from that experience. They they increased their uh, demand and need and understood that they had a need to have greater insight into how are the risks forming in, in real time. And that has, that has created some challenges for the capital market community because before then, sort of technology and market structure wasn't really rigged to support that uh, situation. So what you have now in response to Dodd-Frank, the regulation in the US, and it's called EMIR and MIFID, MIFID 1 and soon MIFID 2 in, in Europe, is that there is a heck of a lot of reporting going on instead. So now these are, uh, you know, gazillions bytes of, of, of data uh, uh, trying to, to portray who is one, owning what is sent up the chain of market participants to regulators, and then they get this sort of data sea of data and they sort of try to make sense of, uh, of, uh, of that and try to distill insight into where, where do we have risk and issues forming in the, in the markets and where are potentially some sort of shenanigans going on. Uh, now to your point, if you, could, if you could actually give regulators access to real time access to what, what sort of what is actually going on in a market and who is doing what and who is in possession of what, that need and that requirement that is, you know, only 10 years old, uh, so uh, could perhaps be better satisfied. Uh, but of course, then you then you have to then you also have to agree across the participant in the market that this is the way we want to organize the market. This is the technology we want to use. That and that takes us back to the one of the challenges to adoption. So. Uh, uh, I think that is how we see the regulatory dynamics in terms of this technology. The technology holds great promise, but it'll be a while before we'll, we will see it sort of implemented to its full uh, ability to satisfy uh, those kinds of needs. Now, do you think that 
you know, in the long term, this is something that is desirable. I mean, if if you if we come down to, I guess, the perspective of consumers and sort of users of financial services, uh, and on the other end, we have the regulator. In the middle, we have you know, companies, service providers, uh, uh, financial market participants, etc. You know, the 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 companies in the middle are sort of in between the, the, the regulator that is pushing them to give them more information and to provide more reporting and provide more insights into their business. And on the other side, uh, satisfying the needs of customers and the customers want more privacy and want more protection of their data, et cetera. Um, where, where do you think the cursor lies there for say, a good balance between uh, regulatory oversight and um, you know, protecting the data and the, the, the interests of, uh, of regular citizens? I mean, ultimately, those are uh, political uh, decisions, actually. Uh, What should the balance be between regulators, market participants, uh, and consumers? Uh, I think it was fair to say that, you know, the lessons, you know, we were not super happy with what happened after the financial crisis in 2008, and that sort of moved the needle quite significantly in terms of politicians' view on what that balance should look like. But once you've actually agreed on a set of rules, and currently we have Dodd-Frank and potentially in the US, and potentially that'll be eased up a little if the new administration gets uh, what they uh, what they want. But fundamentally, once you have a rule set, a set of rules, then, then I think there is a common interest across the participants in the market and regulators and investors and consumers to actually satisfy that need as cheaply and as efficient as, as, as efficiently as possible. And of course, this is where tech comes in. That is where innovation comes in. Can we leverage new technology to, to satisfy those requirements uh, better? But the actual decision on, on how much should a regulator know and for what purpose and how do we protect privacy and so on, that, that is actually ultimately a political decision. So uh, NASDAQ, so your company has been like sort of an active investor in some of the young blockchain startups. So, so tell us about your activities in, in this space. What, what, startup, what kind of startups are you pursuing and what uh, the company has done on the investment front? Yeah, so so part of our innovation program uh, across NASDAQ, we do have a uh, sort of VC-like fund. We do sort of strategic investments in in startups and also in slightly bigger companies when that makes sense. And in the blockchain space, we of course done two investments: uh, one in chain and one in 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 stratum. And of course, we are looking for situations where. We have unique teams with unique capabilities, with unique uh, uh, technology, and also technology that we can uh, integrate with, 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 with our technology to, to, to create both value for us and for the company that we in, invested in, and also to leverage our, our, our resources around the world in terms of our uh, sales resources, in terms of our business development resources, in terms of our strategic resources, legal and regulatory uh, capabilities to sort of uh, bring additional value to to the companies we uh, invest in. So we are looking for great teams, great people, and people that are interested in learning, uh, actually, because to adopt an idea to the specific needs of capital markets is, uh, you know, like all other markets, has some unique uh, desires, so so a willingness to adopt, and of course, in the core, there has to be some kind of exciting technology uh, as well, and that that is actually uh, true for both uh, chain and and, uh, and stratum. If we talk about specifically about our blockchain investment so far, so just touching on on the on chain, and so we've already talked about the uh, the post trade plumbing, and we've sort of touched on link, and I, I think most of our listeners will be somewhat familiar with the link platform. So can, can you talk about sort of the long-term vision for that product uh, from, from the perspective of NASDAQ and you know, how it fits in you know, the, with the greater picture of, uh, of the NASDAQ financial framework? Yep. So uh, Link is an application that is a part of uh, the NASDAQ financial uh, uh, framework, as you said. Uh, that, that framework is a generic framework that can be used across all kinds of asset classes, commodities, uh, fixed income, stocks, uh, publicly listed stock, private stocks, et cetera, basically any, any asset you can imagine. 
And then we have uh, sort of market specific uh, applications and, and, and Link was for the private company uh, space. So that is now an integrated part of the NFF offering. We're going to leverage that technology now when we do the uh, uh, implement the uh, the contract we signed with the Swiss exchange, which is about uh, uh, structured products in the uh, OTC space uh, in the uh, in the Swiss uh, market. Uh, the the actual pilot we were running on the West Coast. Uh, we sort of halted that a little bit, and we're sort of uh, analyzing the results of that. But the technology uh, uh, we continue to enhance and develop, and it's actually a standard part of our offering now to uh, to anyone around the world. Okay, so this is actually a, a in in production at, at this time. The technology is available. Components of it are are uh, in production. Uh, we're going to uh, enhance it and evolve it and and expand on it for the various projects that we uh, implement around the uh, world. So you can say it is, is in production. The specific pilot we were running on the west coast in the U.S. We paused that for the time being. I see. And are you, are you able to talk about sort of more specifics like uh, trading volumes, like number of users, how many people are using this platform day to day? Uh, I mean, the Nasdaq Financial Framework is uh, not specific to that. That is a generic framework that anybody uh, across large and small clients around the world can uh, use. So it's difficult to talk about that. If you look at it from that perspective, we are contemplating you know thousands of uh, of uh, of users around the uh, the world. The specific uh, pilot in in on the West Coast for private company share was just a handful of companies that we were working with and was pretty confined to uh, to that. So the, the the idea behind the link platform, as I understand it, is uh, before a company goes public, the uh, they can sort of issue their shares on a blockchain, I'm assuming uh, based on chains technology, and then people can trade these shares before the IPO. Yeah, which is nothing new. I mean, that is not something that was enabled by uh, blockchain technology. That's the way the private company uh, companies market has been operating for a very long time. But uh, this was a this was a way of proving the uh, value of the technology in in sort of that generic space. So, can we expect to see other like uh, projects come out uh, from Nasdaq based on let's say Stratum's technology or Chain's technology? Yeah, so we have two ways uh, to market for uh, for those innovations. One is when we do it as part of our transaction business, as we talked about before, we run exchanges and CCPs and CEDs, uh, particularly in North America and in uh, in uh, Europe. We are uh, we have the we have sort of three publicly announced initiatives. We had the Link Pilot. We have the uh, payment solution that we did together with uh, City here in the US. We had the voting pilot in uh, Estonia. We have a couple of other initiatives that we're working on that are yet to be uh, publicized. So that's one channel. The other channel is, of course, the work we are doing with our clients on the market technology side. Uh, we talked about NIAX before, where we leveraged the, this technology for uh, uh, advertising forward contract purposes uh, here in New York. And uh, we just talked about the Swiss uh, initiative uh, as well. We also are working on a couple of design studies with the potential uh, uh, clients for other purposes. But those are who those clients are and exactly what that is about is, is, is not uh, publicly announced yet. So, of course, like in the blockchain space, there's, uh, there's like, like blockchain platforms which, uh, which, which build like financial ledgers, distributed financial ledgers. And then there are other st startups like Stratum that build like proof of process technology, right? Like, so if there's any particular process happening inside an enterprise, recording each step of the process and making the conclusions from that process accessible to other enterprises. So does your group have any interest in like this kind of proof of process technology or like certification or time stamping technology and, to you, and its use in capital markets? I mean, obviously, there are the number of uh, workflows uh, in capital markets that uh, that could benefit from that kind of uh, capabilities is almost uh, infinite. So, 
and with regulatory demands for actually proving that your workflows and processes are secure, uh, you know, that is obviously an area of, of interest to a to a company like Nasdaq and to to to, to ourselves and the clients of our uh, solutions. And of course, the unique capabilities of Stratum Technologies is is uh, something that was attractive to us in uh, in making decision to do an investment and to do a sort of strategic partnership with Stratum uh, in in that space. And yeah, we're uh, we're very happy and excited to have uh, to have Nasdaq uh, as an investor and as a partner, and uh, you know, we've. Uh, oh, and 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 are looking forward to uh, being able to announce some some things, uh, some uh, being able to announce some joint um, joint uh, software or partner with uh, in in in, uh, in a, the context of our partnership, you know, soon. Um, so before before we we wrap up here, we 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 couldn't have you on uh, without talking at least for a few minutes about ICOs. Uh, and so uh, I, I'd like to ask you, you know, at, as uh, from coming from the perspective of Nasdaq. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on ICOs, and how do, how do you see this uh, this sort of new wave of, of of capital coming into the blockchain space? You know, of course, we 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 know the existence of these uh, uh, crypto assets. You know, the uh, the ether and the bitcoins and the and the uh, ICOs, uh, those tokens uh, as well. I mean. Currently, our focus resists, sort of rests in the space of the sort of the technical innovation uh, of uh, distributed ledger uh, technology and its applicability to uh, uh, capital markets uh, uh, on a broad scale. Uh, uh, as I said, we, we, we know the existence of these uh, ICOs and uh, that it attracts a lot of capital and, uh, and interest. And... Um, um, yeah, we, we, we just see what's going on without having a sort of strong opinion of whether that is a good or a bad thing. We, we just see what's going on for the time being. And um, it's impressive to see the, the growth in the space. So I think like from the from the ICO markets perspective, there, there seems to be like, like two interesting pieces to it. A, a, many of the ICOs are actually like securities for good or bad. So we're seeing like startups essentially issue like securities on the on the, on the public blockchain and the the second part of it is uh, there is this new technology which is the technology of decentralized exchange where um, where not only can these securities be issued on the public blockchain but they can be exchanged peer to peer without creating any kind of uh, counterparty risk so me buying securities from you over the blockchain without uh, without me needing to trust you in any way right so kind of like these protocols are are in operation and ha have you sort of been following this technology and do you think like this kind of technology can 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 like create an alternative to the, the current way exchange works in capital markets I mean, I think it's an interesting uh, proof point in terms of the uh, the sort of the, the the functioning of the technology in capital markets that it actually proves that that peer to peer processing of uh, of uh, digitized assets actually uh, you know works. Uh, I, I think we subscribe to the vision and 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 that it would be fantastic that if you had a uh, a um, like an internet of, of value and a, a sort of a, a rails that is global and borderless. Uh, uh, and that would be greatly sort of beneficiary to, to uh, mankind, actually, to, 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 to have that. Now, at the same time, you do have to marry that with existing laws and uh, regulations, which is, uh, is critical. And it's also important to, to make sure that investors and consumers have uh, sort of ample protection uh, in, uh, in, uh, in those uh, markets, but also that the companies have uh, suitable uh, uh, protection for them to be viable in the, in the long term. So it's, I mean, it's, it's an exciting space to to follow, uh, uh, and right now we've sort of seen a, of course, a fantastic sort of boom in the use of uh, of, of that technology and that structure. 
uh, uh, but it's also going to be interesting to see as time goes by and we sort of see investors or you know buyers of these tokens sort of also expecting uh, delivery of what they think they've bought and that that's going to be also interesting to see how that works out over time. Do you think that a, a regular a regulated exchange such as NASDAQ could one day uh, get into uh, trading uh, cryptocurrencies, tokens, uh, digital assets? Uh, well, if there is a if there is a need and desire for that kind of uh, certainty and and uh, you know fair and orderly markets uh, and and consumer and investor and participant protection that a regulated exchange can bring. You know, if, if, if Nasdaq is not doing it, you know, I guess someone else will uh, do it. But ultimately, there needs to be that uh, need in that uh, community for that to be a sort of a viable proposition to a, to, a, to, a, to a market or to a community. And I'm not sure we're there yet, but, you know, we'll see. All right, great. Well, uh, Frederick, it was great to have you on the show today. It was fascinating to hear uh, your thoughts uh, and your perspectives coming from the uh, coming from the point of view of Nasdaq on uh, on how blockchain technologies will will uh, are, are developing and will develop in the coming years in the capital market space. So, once again, thanks uh, for coming on the show today. Awesome, my pleasure. And thanks again to our listeners for once again tuning in. We are part of Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. If you like the show, there are multiple ways you can support us. You can uh, leave us a tip. Uh, The tipping addresses will be in the show description. You can also uh, leave us an iTunes review uh, or you can just send us an email, uh, you know. Tell us, uh, say hi, uh, or uh, or tweet at us uh, at EpicenterBTC. So thanks so much, and we look forward to coming back next week.